afternoon. Uh, I'm David Blumenthal, President of the Commonwealth Fund, and it's a pleasure to join you today. Congratulations on a wide-ranging and timely international exchange on issues of race and health care, issues that are of paramount concern across all healthcare systems and especially in the developed world. As I think about how to add to the discussion at this point in the conference, I think looking ahead to what is possible and what might be done to ameliorate some of the problems that racism creates in our healthcare systems makes the most sense. Uh, in our efforts to advance health equity at the Commonwealth Fund, under the leadership of Dr. Lori Zephyr. We've put together a program of philanthropic intervention that we hope may provide lessons for other philanthropies and even perhaps for governments that are trying to address the problems of race and racism in our healthcare system and in healthcare generally. Changing the healthcare system is not going to be sufficient to create an equitable healthcare environment for people of differing race and ethnicity in the healthcare age. But it is necessary. It is part of the solution. Certainly, problems of inequity have their roots in deep societal problems, social and economic and cultural. So to thoroughly address the questions that you have been raising, as I'm sure you've discussed, will require an all of society approach. But we at the Commonwealth Fund take on a smaller problem, that of the healthcare delivery system, knowing that it is an important part of the solution. We've addressed it, we've addressed help abolishing and reducing racism on three fronts. First is changing culture and mindset within the healthcare delivery system. The second is spreading models of best practice for anti racist healthcare programs. And the third is shaping public policy to encourage more equal care across different races and ethnicity. Let me say a little bit about each of these. Starting with mindset. Healthcare providers and personnel, the people who work day in and day out in healthcare systems, are part of the larger society. They swim in the ocean that surrounds them. So they come to work and work hard. They go home to families, to friends, to communities, and absorb the moan, the mores and cultural attitudes that they find there. And of course, we know that racism is often endemic. Certainly in the United States, it is endemic to the larger society. Professionalism and professional training can reduce the effects of these larger societal influences. Sometimes they can significantly alter them to the effect that they are not materially important. But that is not often the case. So in addressing racism within the healthcare system, we have to address the mindset of the personnel who work in that system. Fund has just begun to characterize and address this culture and mindset problem and issue. And we've done it and are planning to do it in a number of ways. First, we are conducting surveys and focus groups with frontline healthcare personnel to understand how they perceive issues of race as they encounter them every day, in effect, to define the mindset 
that is prevalent in our healthcare system. We're also conducting surveys and focus groups of marginalized patients to see how they perceive their journey through the healthcare system from the standpoint of their race and ethnicity and its influence on how they are treated. We are also creating real-time reporting systems for healthcare personnel. These are, if you will, incident reports equivalent to the safety reporting systems that have sprung up in many parts of healthcare systems, certainly in the United States they have. We want to get particular examples, examples that are precise and immediate and meaningful to managers and leaders within the healthcare system. These will be the stories that capture the attention and imagination of managers. And then we are studying successful movements that have created major culture change in other aspects of our society. And let me say a little bit about those because I think they offer both hope and underline the challenges in changing the culture that is so important in our healthcare systems with respect to race and ethnicity. So we have seen social movements dramatically change societies. In the United States, our civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s was a earthquake from the standpoint of race and ethnicity. This is a legendary address given by Reverend Martin Luther King uh, on the Washington Mall, his I Have a Dream speech, which may be familiar to a number of people attending this conference. It is an iconic speech uh, and has motivated generations of young people and others to seek a more fair and racially equitable society. It hasn't been sufficient, but it is part of a ongoing social movement. We've seen the same thing closer to healthcare with smoking. At least in the United States, the idea of secondhand smoke, the idea that you should not smoke in crowded or areas, shared space, has had a major effect on the prevalence of smoking. Uh, and this happened uh, without huge legislative intervention, at least in the United States. It was a social and cultural movement. And then, of course, we are watching the emergence of LGBTQI rights, including gay marriage and other privileges and benefits and rights that would have been almost inconceivable 30 years ago. So the question we're asking is what we can learn from these deep social changes that occurred intentionally over decades and that may provide lessons for what those of us who want to address race and ethnicity can hope to, hope to do. Part of the solution is to create information that is tangible and dramatic and that shows the effect of race and ethnicity in healthcare. And the Commonwealth Fund is also pursuing that line of work that part of the social change and uh, cultural change movement uh, is to bring before the public evidence that a problem exists. And we are uh, continually publishing work on the comparative performance of U.S. states in dealing with race and ethnicity in healthcare. This is an example of a recent report that we published, uh, and it is an essential element, by no means sufficient, but an essential element in dealing with culture and mindset, especially among leadership in healthcare. There are examples of shining, of, of castles on the hill, if you will, shining uh, models of efforts by healthcare systems to seriously address race and ethnicity within their walls. 
We've identified a number of these, one at Rush University in Chicago, Illinois, another at my own home institution of Massachusetts General Hospital. And once identified, we engage in efforts to propagate and spread those models to organizations that wish to emulate them. We do this through collaboratives run by organizations such as our Institute for Healthcare Improvement, to which we've given a large grant to bring healthcare organizations together to study and, and learn from each other on how to address race and ethnicity uh, in their healthcare systems. And we work with the organized representatives of these institutions, such as our American Hospital Association. Uh, and state hospital associations. We're working with the Illinois Hospital Association, for example, to develop measures of racism uh, and measures of race in healthcare uh, and to create models for how to do that. Last area and one of the most important, especially for countries where the government is much more important in healthcare systems than it is in the United States, is that we look constantly at public policy opportunities to improve equity in our healthcare systems. We've been developing protocols, analytic approaches to evaluating the racial impact, the disparate racial impact of policies that may not have been looked at from that point of view. A great example from the Commonwealth Fund's experience is work that we did prior to the enactment of our Affordable Care Act, which has been a great positive influence on balance on disparities by race and ethnicity in healthcare. But one element in that law was to allow children to stay until age 26 on their employment-based health insurance policies of their parents. Now this seemed like a totally logical thing to do. 150 plus million Americans are insured through their place of employment. And if those policies had to include children up to the age 26, many young Americans who have graduated from college or high school uh, and are no, were no longer on either a school or a parental program became uninsured. And we did have a dramatic effect, not we, but the United States had a dramatic effect on the level of uninsurance among young people. But lo and behold, white Americans are much more likely to have employer-based employment-based insurance than our people of uh, other races and ethnicity. And the result of that was to increase the differences in the prevalence of insurance between young white people and young people of color. That was an un unintended and unanticipated effect, one that we should have been cognizant of before we undertook it, before we, before we uh, analyzed it. There are also opportunities for new constructive policy initiatives that are under uh, consideration in the United States and that we are helping uh, to analyze for the benefit of uh, policymakers at the national and local level. These in include things like paying through insurance and government reimbursement for the measurement and improvement of racial disparities. They could include requirements for the public disclosure of differences in outcomes and process of care for people of varying race and ethnicity. And they must also include the development of better measures of race and ethnicity that capture the full diversity of our population and I expect many of yours as well. With regard to that, I was able with a colleague recently to publish a article in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the very difficult problem of measuring race and ethnicity in electronic databases that are now increasingly common in the United States. And particularly the difficulty of recruiting 
balanced and representative populations for clinical trials of new and emerging healthcare technologies when race is not accurately recorded in the databases or actually maybe not recorded at all in the databases from which populations that are recruited to those clinical trials are identified. This is a surprisingly difficult issue, but fundamental to all public policy in the, uh, and the encouragement of anti-racist healthcare interventions. All these are promising strategies. They're experiments. We will monitor them and make sure that they achieve as close as possible to their intended results. We are a small foundation. The United States spends every minute twice as much as our annual budget at the Commonwealth Fund, which points to the need for an all of society and all of healthcare effort to address racism and race racial differences in how people are treated in our healthcare systems. We look forward with great interest to sharing those experiences and hearing about yours over time. These are common international problems with slight modification from place to place. But fundamentally, this change management, change movement requirement is a shared obligation across all healthcare systems. We should take on the challenge of eliminating racism in our healthcare system in this generation. Thank you. And uh, grateful thanks to uh, Dr. Blumenthal for uh, for that that keynote. Um, we're, we're at the end of the day now, so we're going to be winding up, and I know that people have been sitting for a long time, and uh, so we're not going to take we're not going to take that long. So. Can we have a look at the can we have a look at the sketch, Zara? Have it up there. That'd be fantastic. And whilst of Zara's doing that, I'll tell you that we've had 3.8 million impressions on Twitter today. 3.8. And that's absolutely brilliant. So that's great. And 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 we were trending. I don't know if we're still trending, but we were trending even with all the other things that were going on in the with the in the UK today. So that's fantastic. I have to do a shout out to Krithi Ravi, who is the person who created the list, um, so that everybody can have a look at that list. And I think it's, uh, I think it's brilliant that he's actually done that. Um, and we are here again tomorrow. Now, we're supposed to wind up the day. Um, and I'm going to say my bit about what I thought was the most inspiring thing for me today. I, and I, I learned so much from all the speakers today. Two of the key things for me were thinking about children and young people and how we engage with them and what we need to do and how we need to go back. Oh, oh wow, fantastic. Look at David, David looks great. <laughs> I look terrible, what is he doing? What's that? What? <laughs> that is awful. My, my mouth is all twisted. It's just like, it's, it's just, <laughs> Habib looks great. I mean, it's just. I mean, <laughs> Lord Victor said he looks great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. Anyway, going back to what I was saying, really, really, I think we have to think about our children and young people and how we deal with them. But for me, the most you know, inspiring thing and the thing that I scribbled down as quickly as I possibly could, but I'm going to steal it from him, was Andy Burness's five points in messaging, messaging and, and how we change. I thought that was absolutely brilliant, and unashamedly, I'm going to steal that, because it is absolutely brilliant. And if you didn't take notes on it, it was really, really good. Knowing the data, having the knowledge, when you're going to be speaking to somebody, and turn it into a met metaphor. And he, he mentioned uh, that what David did about the aircraft and showing you know, the 200 people a day actually dying from, uh, from racism. I thought that was great. And then what you expect from them. You know, what, Don't go in there not knowing what you expect from them. Know what you want from them and have examples of things that have worked. Absolutely fantastic. To give them hope. Hope is really key because we've been talking a lot about how dreadful and hard and difficult things are. And I was talking to a gentleman, I can't see him at the moment, he was here 
I was talking to him outside earlier, and he was saying it's all very depressing. But if we can give people hope, that's fantastic. And of course, having the messenger have had, having had lived experience is also invaluable. Those are the things I captured. I, I suspect there's much more in there, so I'm having those notes. But those, that, was, that was the thing that really, really stood out for me today, apart from everybody else who was absolutely fantastic. So thank you for staying with us. David will say his bit now. I don't want to keep you longer, so I will be really brief because I've promised you tomorrow is going to be great. You've got to come back, come back early. We have a great day tomorrow. But um, for me, I think the fact that this conference is taking place at this time in history and with almost 2,000 people online participating around the globe with us and experiencing the learning. I, I have been in this field for three decades, but I have learned a lot today. And so the future is bright. I do leave here with a sense of hope that this generation with the information, the knowledge, the tools, the examples we've gotten today, and we will get tomorrow, we can make the world a better place. Absolutely fantastic. See you tomorrow. Have a fantastic evening. Uh, enjoy yourselves. If you're at home, go and get yourself a rum and coke. If you're here, go and get yourself a Costa's just up the road. Take it easy. Good night. Bye-bye.